place to hide this weary soul this vagabond I try with all my might but I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting a vagabond and just when
you're the same guy you heard your children you hear your children now you are the same guy you are the same guy you answered prayers back then for this morning. He's the same. We sing. You were providing me. You are providing now. You are the same. Yes, you are the same. Yeah. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same, God. You are the same, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaking.
As one voice, we lift it up in faith. If that doesn't get you going in the morning, being reminded that he won't fail, then man, I'm just, uh, I'm glad you're here to hear the message today because you need it and it's going to be a blessing to you. So would you turn and greet someone this morning? Let them be, you be a reminder to them that God's not going to fail them. He'll never leave them. He's with them and he's a firm foundation. If you're worshiping with us online, we love you. We see you and we're so glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. You may be seated. And as you're being seated this morning, First of all, let me just say, the worship in this room, my goodness, woo! There is something powerful going on. It is incredible. There is revival happening in this place and around the country, and it is good, and we're so thankful. And, and I just wanna say selfishly, I love you, and I love worship with you. When you do come here in the mornings, I hope you'll come be as close down here to the front and towards the middle as you can for selfish reasons, because I wanna see you. I want to know you. I want to hug your neck. I want to be more connected to you as your pastor because we love you and we want to spend time with you. You're welcome to sit wherever you want, but just know that my heart is that you're as close to me as possible. And I hope that you will continue to do that because that God is just doing something so cool in this place. And church is just more fun when we do it together. So we want you to be a part of it and to be connected in that way for sure. But I also want you to be able to just take a deep breath this morning. Can you do that? Just a whoo. You know what I think? I think we don't do that enough. Be able to find those places and go to those spaces where you really refresh yourself. I don't know whether you get refreshed getting your nails done or maybe it's doing a daily quiet time, spending time in God's word, or maybe you're a hunter or something along those lines of where you're able to get away. Maybe it's a sport where you find refreshment or going to the gym and having a place where you think maybe it's in your car when you're able to shut the radio off or <laughs> maybe it's that shower time where you're actually able to have some one-on-one -on -one time with God. I don't know where you refresh but I know refreshment is important. And I know for me, there's lots of places and ways where I refresh, but I know I'm a deep breather. And I typically know when I'm getting a, a fresh breath of, of God's presence, normally it's correlated with an actual fresh breath, a deep breath. And one of those places where I know that happens for me is when I get to go to my dad's property in Madisonville. I was there on Friday with my boys fishing and just enjoying God's creation. And I got to one of those places where I just was able to whew, take a deep breath to be able to put everything back in perspective. And remember that no matter how hectic life may be, that we serve a God who loves us, who's in control, who's got a good plan and he's with us. You wanna talk about refreshment, we've got an awesome opportunity for your soul to be refreshed in just a couple of days. We've got Ash Wednesday service happening in the chapel. It's a powerful service where we really get our hearts centered 40 days out from the coming of Easter of preparing our hearts, 
reflecting and remembering the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And it's a great time of community and connection. So that's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the chapel. It's gonna be a really powerful time um, of just worship and connectedness. And so that's gonna be something that we want you to come and be a part of. And so that way you're able to be refreshed during that time of experience there because refreshment is kind of the theme of the day. Pastor Lee Strobel is with us today. Can we give some love to him? And he's bringing just such a timely message about how to find rest in a restless world. And you know what? There is a lot of restlessness in the world that we're living in today, but there's also a lot of hope. We see it out there. We sense it in this room as God continues to get our hearts right, to connect with us and remind us that no matter what we're going through, that he is the rest that we need because we belong to him. We love to worship through song and praise, but we also love to worship through giving. So would you stand with us now that we've been refreshed through that time of offering and that time of worship, and let's continue to worship and let our hearts go out to the one that we belong to, who we love and who loves us. Let's sing together, come on.
Father, as we hear about the word of revival filtering in from around the country, we pray right now that you would revive our hearts, revive our church, revive our community, revive our nation, revive our world. May each one of us, whatever it means today, walk away from this place having come closer to you. Pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Well, it's great to, well, I was going to say how great it is to be with you, and I, I, it is great to be with you, but I got to be totally honest and tell you, I'm glad to be anywhere after what happened to me at Little Rock, Arkansas. I went to Little Rock to speak at a charity event, and this pastor picked me up from the airport, and we're driving to the event, we're chatting along the way. He said, yeah, he said, I, I told a young woman in our church, I said, Lee Strobel's going to speak tonight. She said, oh, the guy who wrote The Case for Christ? Is he still living? (laughs) So I'm glad to be anywhere. I'm glad to be alive after that, but especially glad to be with you here today. And I want to begin by asking you some questions. Here's a question. Do you ever feel tired during the day? Do you ever find yourself yawning a lot during the day? When you get up in the morning, do you feel particularly groggy these days? Do you feel overbooked and overwhelmed and overworked and overcommitted? Do you feel more exhausted than exhilarated by life today? Do small things kind of make you angry? Do you have relationships that are draining rather than replenishing? Do you have a to-do list that you never seem to be able to finish? Do you feel like sometimes you're, you're in a car driving down the freeway And life is just a blur as you pass by. Well, chances are you're answering those questions with yes, yes, and more yes. Why? Because we live in the Woodlands, Texas, and there is an epidemic of workaholism in the Woodlands, Texas. This is the land of overachievers, and we don't have time to rest. And you know what? We're proud of it. We're proud of it. Rest is just another word for laziness, right? It's unproductive. If we stand still, we're falling behind. And so we tend to make excuses. We say, you know what? Yeah, 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 I know I need to rest. I'll rest on vacation. And then we pack our vacation with so many activities that when we get home, we say, I need a vacation to recover from my vacation, right? Or we say, you know what? I know I got to rest, but I'll rest on the weekend. And then the weekend comes and we end up running around on a bunch of errands. We're doing laundry. We're taking kids to the little league. We're mowing the lawn. We're trying to catch up on our sleep. So we go to bed for 10 or 12 hours only to wake up with a sleep hangover because as doctors say, sleep marathons just don't work. Houston, we got a problem. We got a problem. The problem is how can we start seeing rest as a positive and not as a negative? How can we begin to see our personal replenishment as an investment in our health and in our well-being? How can we see relaxation as a much-needed recovery from the inevitable busyness of life? Friends, this is a sermon for me as much as it is for all of us. Ever since I turned 70 years old last year, I've been saying I need to slow down more. I need to slow down more. And yet, between then and now, I've traveled 160,000 domestic miles to tell people about Jesus. Now, that's not a bad thing to do, but you know what? So it's a good thing to rest as well and to spend time with the grandkids and to enjoy life and to nurture relationships and to commune more with the Lord. And that's what this message is about. How can we find rest in the midst of our restless world? The topic of rest comes up very early in the Bible. We open the Bible in Genesis 1, verse 1. The very first verse says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that's actually a Hebrew figure of speech, a mermism, which means basically God created everything, created everything. And then you turn to the second chapter, Genesis 2, verse 2, and it says that after God created everything, he rested from all of his work. Now, this is a very misunderstood passage. 
God was not resting because he was tired. He was not physically exhausted. He wasn't, you know, putting his, you know, laying back in a, in a lazy boy chair and putting his feet up and so forth and saying, man, creating those galaxies, whoo, that's a lot of work. I'm, I mean, no, he was not physically exhausted. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. God is spirit. He's not a biological organism like we are, and so he doesn't get tired in the same way that we do. And God is self-sufficient. He doesn't require any input of outside energy to keep him going. Now, the Hebrew word that's used there when it talks about rest is Shabbat. And Shabbat also means to cease or to stop. And so when it says he rested from all his work, what it's saying is that God purposefully stopped because he had already created all that he desired to create. In other words, he finished what he intended to do, and now he had stopped from his work. He had ceased from his work. But of course, at the same time, God was creating a template for us, a format for us. He was illustrated that at some point after we work, we do need to stop, and we do need to rest because we are biological organisms that need rest. And that, of course, is reflected in the concept of the Sabbath, that work should cease every seven days so that we can rest and that we can refocus on the Lord. Well, as I've gone on this quest to learn how to rest more efficiently and effectively, um, one resource that I found particularly helpful is a new book that just came out. It's called Sacred Rest, and it's written by a physician um, named Sandra Dalton Smith. And if anybody knows what it's like to be busy, it's her. I mean, she's not only married um, and has a very active medical practice, but she's got two elementary age boys. And so she understands what it's like to be busy. A lot of insights in that book. And so I've asked the bookstore here and the other campus to um, stock some extra copies of that book. If you wrestle with this area, if you'd like to know how to better rest and replenish yourself, I just recommend this book. It's a lot of good insights in that book. But today I want to talk about four kinds of rest that we need. Physical rest, mental rest, social rest, and spiritual rest. So let's talk first about physical rest. Now, we typically associate the word rest with the word sleep. And of course, there's a connection. That's accurate. We need to sleep in order to be replenished physically, mentally and physically. And Jesus, in his human nature, slept just like everyone else. In fact, Jesus uh, was not above taking a nap. In Luke 8, verses 22 and 23, tells us, one day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got in a boat and they set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep. In fact, this nap was so replenishing to Jesus that he didn't notice that the, a squall had come up and the boat was beginning to get swamped. I mean, that's how deep asleep he was in that nap. Now, our problem today is we don't often take a nap when we need it. We're not getting sufficient hours of sleep at night so that, get this, a staggering 97% of Americans say they feel tired most of the time. So if you feel tired most of the time, you're in the majority. That's not unusual. You're in the majority. And yet sleep is a gift that God wants you to enjoy. Psalm 127 verse 2 says, God gives sleep to those he loves. Sleep replenishes the body. It replenishes the mind. In fact, a lack of sleep can increase your risk for all kinds of health problems, including weight gain, depression, anxiety, heart disease, and diabetes. In fact, just this last week while I was writing this message, a new study came out and said if you're over the age of 45 and your sleep pattern is unpredictable, in other words, you're going to bed different times every night and so forth, there's a correlation between that and developing the condition of hardening of the arteries. So there's all kinds of health issues at risk. Now, this area of sleep, that's one area I've made progress in. Because when I turned 70, I said, you know, I've been burning the candle at both ends for a long time, and I'm just going to draw a line in the sand. I'm going to say, I'm going to get eight hours of sleep every single night. 
just a non-negotiable. That's what I'm going to do. And so I reorganize my life around that. And I go to bed about the same time every night. I stop drinking any caffeine about noon, so I don't have that to deal with when I go to bed. I, start, I stop looking at the computer an hour or two before I go to bed, so my mind is clear as I go to bed. And here's a sleep trick that I learned um, that blows my mind. My doctor actually told me about this, and I think she deals with this in the book as well. I'm not sure, but uh, there is medical research to back this up. It sounds weird, and I'm telling you, this is the only church on planet Earth where you're going to hear this, okay? <laughs> when you go to bed, put on a clean pair of socks. Put on socks when you go to bed. I know that sounds weird, but they've done medical research on this, and guess what they found? People who wear socks when they go to bed not only fall asleep quicker, but they reported staying asleep longer, and they experience an overall better quality of sleep. So that's worth the price of admission right there. They, you can take that to the bank. You know, give, it, give it a shot. See what happens. Now, sleep is a passive form of physical rest, but there are also active ways to get physically replenished as well. For example, a study at the University of Georgia showed, get this, if you exercise just lightly three days a week for just 20 minutes at a time, that reduces the fatigue symptoms in your life by 65%. Just 20 minutes, three days a week, light exercise. So in other words, um, if you take a 20-minute walk instead of sipping a Red Bull, you can have all kinds of health benefits, including increased blood flow to the heart and increased increase oxygen flow to your lungs. Friends, physical rest and recuperation are not a luxury. <laughs> They're a necessity. God designed our bodies and our brains to be thoroughly refreshed each day. And so the first thing we need to do on our quest for rest is to make the decision that we're going to get a sufficient amount of sleep and rest and exercise in our lives. So, you know, do what I did. Draw a line in the sand. Said, you know, from here on out, maybe you don't need eight hours sleep. I do. Maybe you need six or seven. But just say, whatever it is that I need, I'm going to make sure I get it. And I'm going to organize my life around that and protect that. And I'm telling you, the health benefits you'll realize very quickly. Second, let's talk about mental rest. Mental rest. You know, these days, our minds are bombarded with more stimulation than any people have experienced in history. There's a 24-7 news cycle. It never ends. There's stimulation from social media. There's hours spent on the computer and on iPhones. There's a, a constant stream of emails and text messages. In fact, there's a, there's a mind-numbing number of streaming services to keep us entertained, Right? I mean, Leslie and I moved, um, we downsized, and we moved, bought a little place in Montgomery. And, um, uh, and so I called up the cable company. This is the cable company. I called them up, and I said, hey, I need, uh, we're moving into a new house. I'd like to get uh, high-speed internet. Oh, no problem. We got great high-speed internet. Okay, terrific. And I also like cable television. And she laughed. She said, oh, we don't do that anymore. I said, this is the cable company, right? You say, yeah, yeah, but we don't do that. Nobody uses cable anymore. It's all streaming services. St streaming. So now I got like 23 streaming services, each with one program I like, right? <laughs> I'm paying who knows how much money a month for all these streaming services. But, you know, you're inundated with all this entertainment and all this news and so forth. And then there's something else your mind copes with. It's the running commentary that you have during the day. You're often critiquing yourself. You're second-guessing yourself. You're criticizing yourself. You're reliving your past and wishing you'd said this or wishing you'd done this, but you didn't. You're fretting over your future, and we become exhausted by our mental thoughts. Dr. Dalton Smith said, mental fatigue is one of the significant causes of avoidable accidents. When the mind is tired, it no longer has the capacity to effectively control our body and reflexes. The result is increased falls, car accidents, and damaging mistakes. Friends, we need to make a pact to intentionally regulate what it is we let into our minds. 
The Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about those things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Friends, are we replenishing our minds on a daily basis with whatever is true and noble and right and lovely and pure and admirable? Are we, are we focusing things on things that are excellent and praiseworthy? Or are we allowing the ugly pollution of the world to just wash over our brains? Well, there is something we can do to rest from all this pollution of the world, to stop it from having so much influence on our minds. What can we do? We can meditate on the Word of God. We can meditate on the Word of God. I'm not talking about just reading the Bible. We all read the Bible, I hope. What I'm talking about is not just reading Scripture. It's lingering on it. It's pondering it. It's soaking it in. It's letting it refresh us and realign our minds with the mind of God. Now, this is different from the kind of meditation you hear about in Eastern religions. In Eastern religions, the goal through chanting meaningless mantras and things like that, the goal in Eastern religions through meditation is to empty your mind. You want to empty your mind. That's not Christian meditation. Christian meditation is you want to fill your mind with the Word of God. It's the opposite. One scholar said, meditation is a way of internalizing God's Word taking it deep into our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can work through it to guide us, teach us, purify us, and transform us from within. In the Old Testament, we see God telling Joshua in Joshua 1, verse 8, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Friends, why not make 2023 the year that you begin to systematically meditate on the Word of God? How do you do that? You, you start, good way to start, maybe every other day, 20 to 30 minutes, go to a quiet place, withdraw to a quiet place for, say, half an hour, choose a passage of Scripture, not a lot, maybe, maybe half a chapter, a third of a chapter, and go through what I call the three A's of meditation. The first A stands for the word ask. To ask God, God, open my eyes, open my heart to the truths of your scripture. Help me to, um, to see things enabled by your Holy Spirit, to understand things that your Holy Spirit will enable me to understand. Bring the scriptures to life through your Holy Spirit. When you pray those kind of, God loves to answer those prayers. Ask him to teach you through this passage, to convict you, to encourage you, to grow you, to transform you through this passage. That's the first thing to ask. The second A word is to absorb. And, and I chose that word very carefully because I'm not just talking about perusing scripture. I'm not just talking about reading scripture, racing through it. I'm talking about digging deeply into it. I'm talking about absorbing it. I'm talking about prayerfully pondering it, to internalize it, to contemplate it, to, to say it out loud, to read through it several times, say it out loud, memorize portions of it, take notes, underline, highlight, use commentaries to give you the context of what's going on. Thoroughly understand what it means. In other words, Breathe in the Word of God so that it lives inside of you. And then the third A stands for the word apply. To ask God, how can I put this teaching into action in my life today? God, I want to I use this in my life today. I want it to give me insights that I can apply today in my everyday life. So then make specific plans how to implement this new learning in your everyday activity. 
Psalm 119, verse 99 says, I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. That's how important it is. Now, it can feel awkward at first. You're by yourself. You're, you're really kind of trying to delve in. Your mind begins to wander. I get that. It's okay. As you develop the habit, and then it becomes a daily habit of delving deeply into the Scripture and meditating on it, and you begin to see the benefits in your life, it becomes easier to do and more joyful to do. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Friends, we all need to rest and recuperate from all the ugly and negative mental input that plague us every single day. We need to align ourselves with the mind of God, take time to meditate on his word, because when we do that, when we invest half an hour or so doing that every day, then guess what happens? This reverberates through our hearts and through our minds for the rest of the day, and it's an antidote to the corrosive thoughts and images that will bombard us. So that's physical rest, that's mental rest. But now let's talk about a third kind of a rest, social rest, social rest. You know, we all have uh, different kinds of relationships in our lives, right? We have golfing buddies and we have tennis partners and we have pickleball partners and we've got business partners and we've got neighbors and we've got customers, and we've got colleagues. We've got all these maybe hundreds of different acquaintances in our life, but they tend to be surface-level acquaintances that require more energy from us than replenish us, right? We don't feel comfortable in resting in those relationships and being totally ourselves and letting our guard down totally, because these are surface level relationships. So it's not like you can go up to a neighbor you hardly know and go, hey man, can I tell you about some tough times I'm going through lately? You you don't feel comfortable doing that. And, And that's appropriate because it's all right that we have these surface level relationships. But, but, but we all need at least one authentic, close, safe friendship where we can rest easy in the fact that we can be ourselves and still be fully loved, where we feel safe, where we feel accepted, where we experience mutual encouragement and affirmation, where we can unburden ourselves as we honestly disclose our struggles and our secrets. These are the kind of relationships that bring us rest and replenishment. Here's the key. Here's the key to those kind of relationships. The depth of any relationship in our life is based on what it is we hold in common with the other person. So think about it. If you have a golfing buddy and you love to play golf together and what you hold in common with that person is golf, you enjoy golf, that's great, no problem. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. But there's probably not going to be the opportunity to go tremendously deep in that relationship. But when your commonality is Jesus Christ, there is at least the potential to be able to go extremely deep in your relationship with that other person. The Old Testament describes this in the meeting of a um, low-level shepherd boy by the name of David with the king's firstborn son named Jonathan. And they met and they just hit it off. 1 Samuel 1.18 says, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as himself. That imagery of knitting is important because when you knit, you're knitting together yarn of a similar source, similar quality, right? A similar substance. And in this case, the souls of Jonathan and David were knit together because they shared a commonality, and that is a great love for God. And and sharing this great love, they were able to knit together their souls in a way that went 
far stronger and deeper and more profound and more satisfying and fulfilling than any relationship they've ever had. I mean, I've had all kinds of friendships in my life. I've had colleagues at work. I've had um, in the newspaper business. I've had um, um, neighbors. I've had all kinds of, as you do, all kinds of relationships. But the ones that have brought me the most joy and satisfaction, the ones where I can rest and be myself, where I can be honest about who I am and so, where I can share any secret, those are the relationships where we share Jesus Christ in common. I think of Mark Middleberg. Mark Middleberg and I met in 1987, and I don't think there's a day that's gone by that we haven't talked. Um, We share Jesus in common, and we share the same biblical values. We share the same substance of our souls. We pray together. We pray for each other. We give each other godly counsel and encouragement. Our hearts beat in unison for kingdom purposes. I've never had a relationship that deep. I have no secrets from Mark. He has no secrets from me. And, you know, I think of what the Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 24, where it says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and Mark sticks closer than a brother. Do you have someone like that in your life who sticks closer than a brother? I don't know if you saw this on Twitter the other day, but um, there was an, a, a story, a, a news account of a police officer who was patrolling in his police car, and he came across a car pulled off on the side of the road. And they were showing the body camera of what happened in this encounter. He went up to the car, and there was a man alone in the car at the driver's, in the driver's seat, and he was hunched over, and he was sobbing uncontrollably. And the police officer says, is there something I can do to help? And in between sobs, this young man said, could you give me a hug? And the police officer said, of course I can give you a hug. And so the guy got out of the car, and the police officer gave him a hug, and they sat down, and they talked, and I think the police officer actually gave him his phone number, said, you know, if you want to reach me and talk some more, we can connect. But it made me stop and think, other than someone in your family, who do you go to when you need a hug? Do you have a friend who you can go to to get a hug like that? I hope you do. I hope you have at least that one friendship in your life where the commonality is Christ and where you can go so deep that it's the most rewarding and fulfilling and rejuvenating experience in your life. You know, the ugly truth is there is an epidemic of loneliness in America. That's a fact. And that's not because we lack relationships. As I said, we've all got a million acquaintances. We all know a bunch of people. But we don't have that kind of deep and profound friendship that can bring us rest and replenishment. So why not make this the year that you say, if I don't have that, I need that. I don't want to go the rest of my life and not experience that kind of friendship. And guess what? This is a great place to find a friend like that. This this church, Woodlands Church, is teeming with people who would love to have that kind of friendship with you. So why don't you join a small group or or join a serving group or uh, go on a a short-term mission trip? Or, you know, if you kind of want to come out of the shadows and make make yourself part of this community, then next Sunday after the 1130 service at both campuses, um, we have a membership class and free lunch is provided and, and you can meet a whole bunch of folks like you who are seeking to have these kind of relationships and friendships to go deep and to be part of a community of followers of Jesus who take their faith seriously. I mean, I, I think if, if you were to excise, extract, take out Mark Middleberg from my life, it'd be a whole different life, not a life I would like to have. And I'm jealous for you to have that kind of friendship. I can't tell you how many times when I've been down when he's lifted me up and how many times when he's been down and I've lifted him up. 
And when we've gone through difficult times and prayed for each other, and you know, his kids call me Uncle Lee, my kids call him Uncle Mark. And I look forward for the rest of my days having that kind of relationship with Mark and then into heaven forever, have that kind of friendship. Do you have something like that? Friends, don't let another year go by without getting intentional about that kind of relationship. And then finally, let me talk about the last area I want to mention, and that is how do we find spiritual rest? Spiritual rest. Well, we're fortunate because Jesus told us specifically how to find it in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. This is what he said. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me give you some context here. In biblical times, uh, a yoke was a, a horizontal wooden crossbeam that would fit over the necks of two oxen or donkeys who are pulling a cart or pulling a plow. And so, uh, metaphorically, what this uh, yoke represented was uh, um, the people of Israel were yoked to the Word of God. They were yoked to the commands of God. And it was a good thing. It was a positive thing. God created them. He invented us. And so he knows how we can flourish the most. And so God has given us guide rails for our lives. He's given us commands for how to live our life. And as they lived under those that yoke, it was great until the Pharisees started to go a bit overboard and they started to add rules and regulations to these um, commands of God. And pretty soon the Pharisees had added 365 additional prohibitions and 250 additional commandments. And they were heavy on legalism and on oppression and it brought shame and guilt upon people. And the burden, said Jesus, was heavy, and the people were weary. And here comes Jesus, and he says, no, no, no. My yoke is easy, and my yoke is light. In other words, following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, is a fulfilling and a joyful and a grace-filled experience. 1 John 5, verse 3 says, his commands are not burdensome, he made you. He knows how to maximize who you are. And so as we follow his commands, we find that kind of fulfillment and joy and satisfaction. And Jesus is saying, if you yield your life to me, you will experience rest for your soul. And I think this is relevant to us today because too many of us have put ourselves under a burden, an oppressive yoke. We've done it because we've fallen into a pattern of legalism. Our faith isn't really a fulfilling relationship with God. It becomes strict adherence to religious rule-keeping and performance. We compare ourselves to other people. We feel guilty because we don't measure up. I mean, so much of the love that we see in our world is conditional. Oh, I'll love you if you do this. If you're this way, then I'll love you. And we don't say it out loud. But many of us have the implicit belief that if we just prayed more, if we just gave more, if we just attended church more, if we just tried harder, God would love me more. And religion becomes oppressive and it becomes burdensome. And Jesus is saying to you, no, 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 no. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I mean, God loves you maximally because God is love. The, the author, Phil Yancey, put it this way. He says, there is nothing, think about this, there is nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he already loves you. Nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do to make God love you less than he already loves you. He loves you maximally. You don't have to try to pacify him. You don't have to try to prove your love for him. He loves you as much as he can possibly love you. My friend Greg Laurie, the great evangelist and, and pastor, 
uh, just this last week, tweeted this. He said, God is not mad at you. He's mad about you. 1 John 3, verse 1 says, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. So Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, and I will give you rest for your soul. What, what, what does that mean, to come to Jesus? What does that really mean? Well, you know, I, we talked about meditating on the Word of God. I happen to be meditating recently on a passage from Luke chapter 8, the Gospel of Luke, the 8th chapter. And, and I found an insight there that I think is helpful to understand what it means to come to Jesus. Um, in the 8th chapter of Luke, because of his great teaching and his miracles, crowds were starting to be attracted to Jesus. In fact, throngs of people were coming to him. In fact, the, the text says he was almost crushed by the crowds that were surrounding him. They were bumping into him and they were jostling him and they were pressing up against him. But guess what? Nowhere in the text does it say that anybody's life was being transformed. And I thought, isn't that kind of what we do sometimes? When we bump into Jesus, we read a book about Jesus, we come to church and we hear about Jesus, but our life isn't changed. And yet there was a woman in that crowd. She'd been sick, chronically ill for 12 years, but she didn't just bump into Jesus. She desperately reached out and clutched the edge of his cloak. 12 years she'd been sick. She was desperate. She clutches the edge of his cloak, and she is instantly healed, and she is instantly transformed. And Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. See, she didn't just bump into Jesus. She didn't read a book about him. She didn't just encounter him, just wasn't part of the crowd pressing up against him. She opened her hand and grabbed a hold of Jesus. She reached out in desperation to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus offers through his grace. And her life was transformed. And the same is true of us. When we come to Jesus, it's not that we just encounter him. We open our hands and we reach out to him and we receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that he purchased for us on the cross when he died as our substitute to pay for all of our sin. And when we receive this free gift of his grace, then we become a child of God. And then we can rest easy in our relationship with him because the most important matter of life has been settled. You know, the Bible says, these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order to may know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know with confidence. Why? He doesn't want you in a sense of turmoil or anxiety or apprehension about where you stand with him. He wants you to rest easy. His burden is light. He wants you to rest easy to know, I have been adopted as a son or as a daughter of the Most High, and I can enjoy a relationship with Jesus during my life. That will be the joy of my life. And at the end of my life, I'll spend eternity in his presence forever. God wants you to rest easy in that knowledge. Are you? Do you know for a fact? Well, I want to give you an opportunity. If you want to come to Jesus right now, I'm going to give you that opportunity so that you can rest easy in knowing that you've been adopted as a son or daughter forever. So let's just close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you want to take that step, I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. Just in your heart. God, God knows your heart. Just in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, as best I can, I do believe that you are the Son of God. You proved it by returning from the dead. And right now, I confess the obvious, which is that I am a sinner. I know that. I've done things I knew they were wrong before I did them, and I did them anyway. I've sinned. And right now, I want to turn from that, and I want to reach out in repentance and faith and receive your free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. 
Thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much that you endured the torture of the cross so that we could be reconciled forever. Help me, Jesus, to live the kind of life that you want me to live. Because from this moment on, I am yours. And now, Father, we celebrate those that have taken that step just now, whether in this room or online. We celebrate that. We thank you for your great love, your grace that blows our mind. And we pray you would draw us closer and closer to you. Revive us in our faith if we've flagged in our faith. Strengthen our faith. Hold us close. We live in perilous times, difficult times, restless times. But in you, we know we can find peace and we can find replenishment and we can find joy and love and friendship. So we thank you for all of that and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our forgiver and who is our leader and who is our very, very best friend. Amen.